Hello guys, a good day to everyone. So today for pharmacology, we are going to talk about drugs that are used for neuromuscular disorders such as myasthenia gravis and some mus muscle spasm. So we'll start out with what myasthenia gravis is. In this disease, it's a CNS disease. It is characterized by weakness and rapid fatigue of any of the muscles under our voluntary control. So it, it affects, of course, the skeletal muscles. The cause of myasthenia gravis, uh, technically, the cause of myasthenia gravis is unknown. There's a known. The, the one being explained here is uh, just a theory. So there is a breakdown in the normal communication between nerves and muscles. As you can see here in this animation, um, this is the neuromuscular juncture, junction, neuromuscular junction. And as we all well know from our anatomy and physiology subject, the neurons of the central nervous system or the nervous system communicates with our skeletal muscles by means of neurotransmitters, as you can see here. So the neurons are not directly connected to each other. Same goes with the neurons and the muscles. Now, in order to send impulses from the brain for our skeletal muscles to move, it needs these neurotransmitters. And what neurotransmitter is that? It is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is responsible for transmitting the information from our central nervous system to our skeletal muscles in order for our skeletal muscles to move. So in this disease, if uh, what happens here is that, as you can see this little blue light projections on the next portion of this animation here where the acetylcholine will bind with, in myasthenia gravis, these receptor sites, these blue light projections, they are destroyed. By what? By um, the, the body's own immune system, because this kind of disease is autoimmune. Now, the destruction of these receptor sites, or why it causes, or why the, uh, the immune system destroys these receptor sites, it is unknown. Why does that? Now, if these receptor sites are destroyed by our immune system, acetylcholine, as you can see, they have nothing to bind to. So, of course, the transmission of information from our brain to the muscles is disrupted, causing now um, paralysis to occur or inability to move a specific limb or an arm or leg and so on. Now for this disease, myasthenia gravis, there is no cure for it. But there are certain drugs, there are certain treatment that can help relieve the signs and symptoms such as weakness of an arm or a leg muscle. There's also double vision, drooping of the eyelids and difficulty with speech, chewing, swallowing, and later on, which is the last stage of this disease, breathing. Since there are skeletal muscles that are involved with breathing as well. You have this intercostal muscles found on the ribs. So what is our nursing management for this disease? We administer the medications on time and evenly space the intervals to prevent relapse and make most of the energy peaks of the patients. So there are certain times of the day when the patient's energy peaks. So we need to um, tell the patient to utilize that and plan diet and food intake around the patient's ability to swallow since there are also skeletal muscles that are involved in swallowing. Stress the need for frequent rest periods because they are easily tired and establish this very, very important, establish respiratory especially respiratory and neurologic baseline data. 
so that we know if the respiratory status of the patient is already declining due to this disease. Because if this disease reaches the diaphragm, for example, the internal and then external intercostal muscles, that would be very dangerous for the patient because they will be having difficulty in breathing later on. So medical management, we have mestinone, which is an orally active cholinesterase inhibitor. So it increases the amount of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. And this enzyme, cholinesterase, this enzyme is responsible for the lysis or the destruction of acetylcholine if it's no longer needed. So this drug, mestinone, it inhibits that enzyme that destroys acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is there. It, that neurotransmitter will bombard the remaining um, receptor sites in order to enhance communication between our nerves and the muscles. Corticosteroids are also given together with immunosuppressants in order to inhibit the immune system. And remember, I've already discussed to you about immunosuppressants before. These drugs can increase the risk for infection since they immune, uh, they suppress the immune system. So it's very, very important for us to teach the patients to avoid certain situations that can cause them to have an infection, such as going in public places or crowded places, eating raw foods and vegetables, such as fruits and vegetables, or even raw meat, for example, or people with obvious infection, they should avoid them. So examples of immunosuppressants that you can give is cyclosporin and mycophenolate. Atropine sulfate is also given for bradycardia because this medication will pick up the heart rate. Tensilon, this is an interesting drug because this drug is being used to test or to confirm the presence of myasthenia gravis in a patient. And the, the trade name for this is hydrophonium chloride. So the Tensilon test is done by injecting the drug IM. It should be done IM since we are testing the muscles here to diagnose myasthenia gravis. And what happens here, if the patient is injected Tensilon, it prolongs the muscle stimulation and temporarily improves the muscle strength of the patient. Usually this lasts for 30 minutes. And if the patient becomes weak again after 30 minutes, this means that the patient is positive for myasthenia gravis. So injected with Tensilon, observe for 30 minutes. If the patient, if the patient has um, improved muscle strength, improved muscle stimulation, and it will be gone after 30 minutes, patient is positive for myasthenia gravis. Since the patient will have a temporary increase of strength upon the injection of Tensilon. Next, now we go to muscle spasm. This is a disturbance to the normal flow to information in the CNS caused by certain diseases, infections that you may have. One great infection that can cause muscle spasm would be tetanus, tetanus infection, or toxins, injuries that can lead to disturbances ranging from spasms to paralysis. Sometimes there are certain electrolyte imbalances that are happening in our body that can cause muscle spasms to occur. So this results from violent and painful involuntary muscle contraction that is usually caused by muscle overstretching, joint wrenching, and tendon and ligament tearing. When this happens, the injured area floods sensory impulses to the spinal cord, and it responds by eliciting intense muscle contraction in the involved muscle. And pain from muscle spasms is due to lactic acid accumulation. So if you've experienced that before, your skeletal muscles are having a spasm, they involuntarily move, you will experience pain afterwards. Since blood flow is cut off during contraction, so 
the muscles will switch from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. So sensory impulses continue to flood and a vicious cycle of contraction develops. So this is how muscle spasms occur. And they, they can occur if you have imbalances in the electrolytes in your body. What causes this? So insufficient strengthening or stretching before physical activity. That is why it's very, very important for us to do stretching exercises before we engage in sports, before we do weightlifting, before we do jogging or any other intense physical activity that we are going to do, or else muscle spasms can occur. Or if you are suffering from muscle fatigue, let's say for example, um, before the pandemic, I have been working out for four straight years. And sometimes if I spend too much time at the gym working out, I would um, feel some muscle spasms every now and then due to muscle fatigue, especially the muscles that I have been using for that day for a specific workout. Let's say, for example, I did a weightlifting or uh, barbell squats, for example. I, I was exercising my legs and thighs for that um, weightlifting exercise. After doing barbell squats, and usually I lift at around 120 to 140 pounds of barbell uh, of plates, including the bar of the barbell. Later that day, I would experience um, muscle spasms due to muscle fatigue. Or if you are exercising in a heated temperature or in a weather that is not just warm, but hot during the summer, you might suffer from muscle spasms by doing that. Or if you are dehydrated, that's why some people who are exercising, if they do not drink too much or drink enough water for the exercise, they might feel this. Or any, this is the one I have, I have been telling you earlier, electrolyte imbalances in potassium, magnesium, and or calcium. So if you have any imbalances in any of these electrolytes, you will be suffering from muscle spasms. So muscle spasticity occurs when damaged neurons are within the CNS ring or rather than the peripheral areas. So if the CNS is already involved, you can experience muscle spasticity. The site of damage makes this abnormality permanent. So this is permanent, unlike that of the other causes of, of muscle spasm. There's a, because there is an interruption in the balance of excitatory and inhibitory influences within the CNS, which can lead later on to hypertonia or excessive muscle stimulation. And consequent contractures and structural, structural changes may occur. Now there is a loss of coordinated muscle activity. So this one, muscle spasticity, this results from permanent damage to neurons. And take note, neurons, uh, once they are damaged, they no longer can be repaired. Now we go to centrally acting muscle relaxants. So these centrally acting muscle relaxants work in the CNS to interfere with reflexes that causes muscle spasms. They essentially destroy or lie spasms and are often referred to as spasmolytics. Other modalities of spasm and pain relief like rest, heat application, and other physical therapy are used in addition to these drugs. An example of these drugs that are given to patients who are experiencing um, muscle spasticity, muscle spasms due to CNS injury are the following. We have Mepro, Bamate, Metaxalone, Methocarbamol, Orphanodrin, Tizanidin, and Baclofen. So they act on the CNS. They are centrally acting muscle relaxants. So therapeutic action, 
The exact mechanism of these drugs are unknown, but um, it's not fully understood uh, in the involvement of the skeletal muscle, but it is thought that it involves the participation of the upper and or spinal interneurons. So it involves the spinal cord here, the CNS. And it inhibits monosynaptic and polysynaptic spinal reflexes. Other than that, they are CNS depressants. So they diminish the exc excitatory mechanism of these nerves supplying the skeletal muscles. Now, contraindications and cautions. Of course, those with patients with allergy, we need to prevent hypersensitivity reactions or skeletal muscles that are caused by rheumatic disorders because these conditions, they do not benefit from these drugs. So do not give patients who have rheumatic disorders these drugs or patients who have history of epilepsy because CNS depression and imbalance caused by drugs may exacerbate the seizure disorder of the patient. So never ever give these drugs to patients with seizures. Cardiac dysfunction, muscle function of the heart may also depress. That's why we need to monitor the patient's heart rate or cardiac function when giving these drugs. Or conditions that are marked by muscle weakness because these drugs can further exacerbate that condition, muscle weakness. So do not give them to patients who are suffering from muscle weakness, such as patients suffering from myasthenia gravis. Hepatic or renal dysfunction. Do not give these to patients who have those conditions because these drugs can interfere with metabolism or excretion. And baclofen is not indicated for the treatment of spasticity that contribu contributes to locomotion, upright function, or increased function because blocking this spasticity results in loss of these functions. So they are not given to any patients who have spasticity with regards to the movement of the upper extremities. Adverse effects, you can read the rest here of the adverse effects. They are self-explanatory. Uh, I need to emphasize that chlorzoxazone will turn the urine into purple-red color. So you need to advise this to the patient so that the patient will not be shocked with the color of his or her urine. Of course, you do not want your patient to be shocked by that side effect or else they might call the doctor why there might be blood, let's say, for example, coming out of their urine. That is only normal if they are taking chlorosoxazole. Tizanidin has been associated with liver toxicity and the hypertension in some patients. So you need to, we need to monitor the liver function of patients taking tizanidin. Baclofen is tapered off. When we say tapered off, we progressively or slowly remove this drug from its average dose and we minimize the dosage each day until the patient is no longer taking that drug over one to two weeks to prevent the development of psychosis and hallucination. Because if you immediately withdraw the patient from baclofen, they might experience hallucinations and psychosis. So we taper it off for one to two weeks. Interactions. Do not give this to other CNS depressants such as benzodiazepines and barbiturates even alcohol because these drugs and alcohol will further increase CNS depression. So do not give alcoholic beverages or tell the patient not to take any alcoholic beverages when taking these drugs. Now implementation with the rationale. We need to provide additional spasm and pain relief like period, rest period, such as heat application, and since is ordered for pain and positioning to augment the effects of the drug at relieving the musculoskeletal discomfort. And if you see that there are any problems with the liver and renal um, lab results, their liver or their enzyme profile are elevated, 
discontinued the drug to prevent further toxicity with these organs. Monitor the respiratory status to evaluate adverse effects and arrange for appropriate do dose adjustment and the discontinuation of the drug. Most especially if the respiratory and cardiovascular status is already affected, we need to report this to the physician immediately. Provide comfort measures to help patient tolerate the drug effects and safety measures such as adequate light, raise side rails to prevent injuries. And educate the client on drug therapy to promote understanding and compliance. Now we go to the direct acting skeletal muscle relaxants. Now they, these drugs, they enter the muscle, directly enter the muscle to prevent mus muscle contraction. So the drug that is used for this is dantrolene. It acts within the skeletal muscle fibers and interfere with calcium ion release from the muscle tubules. Therefore, the fibers are prevented from contracting and it does not interfere with the neuromuscular transmission and does not affect the skeletal muscle surface membrane. So it directly acts on the skeletal muscle itself. Indications for children, safety and effectiveness is not, is not yet established in children. And dantrolene is used to treat upper motor neuron spasticity in, in children. Those should be accurately calculated based on the body weight. That's why it's very, very important to take the body weight or the body mass index, or no, no, not the body surface area rather of the, of the child. And we need to increase it over time as the child grows older, since they will also uh, increase their weight as they grow older. Children are increased risk for CNS and GI toxicity. That's why we need to monitor for those things. For an adult, they should be cautioned to avoid activities that require alertness, such as driving or operate heavy machinery again, because like benzodiazepines and barbiturates, they can cause confusion and drowsiness. So tell them not to avoid. Uh, tell them to avoid driving or operate heavy machinery again. For pregnant and lactating mothers, they should be uh, advised not to use uh, or to use contraception and alternative methods of feeding, respectively. And for post uh, premenopausal women, there are increased risk for hepatotoxicity in association with the use of dantrolene. So we need to monitor the patient's liver function if you're giving dantrolene to premenopausal women. For ad older adults, they will experience or more likely experience the adverse effects of dantrolene. Older women who are receiving hormone replacement therapy, such as estrogen, will have the same risk for hepatotoxicity with premenopausal women in association with the use of dantrolene. So you need to be very, very careful with that. Again, contraindication and cautions, allergy, it's the same as before, like the one that I've mentioned earlier, spasticity, same as before as well. Hepatic disease, do not give this drug if there is an active hepatic disease such as liver cirrhosis or hepatitis because it will interfere with the drug metabolism. Pregnancy, due to potential effects on the fetus. Women and, or patients older than 35 are cautioned to take this because of increased risk of potentially fatal hepatocellular disease. Or if there is a history of liver disease or previous dysfunction, this will increase the liver susceptibility to cellular toxicity. That's why we do not give these, this drug to a patient who had a previous liver disease. Cardiac disease, because cardiac muscle depression may be at risk. Remember, there's also a muscle of, uh, in the heart, the myocardium, and that may be affected with this drug. So you need to monitor the patient's cardiovascular status when giving this drug. Adverse effects. So you can see here, there are self-explanatory myalgia is pertaining to muscle pain. Um, what else? Now, dantrolene can cause direct hepatocellular damage and potentially fatal hepa hepatitis. That's why when we are giving dantrolene, the doctor should, 
should um should order for frequent liver function tests to be done on the patient in order to check if their liver enzymes are elevated or not because if the liver enzymes are elevated that is an, those are indicators of a liver disease botulinum toxins are associated also with anaphylactic reactions characterized by headache dizziness muscle pain and paralysis Now, interactions, like what I've mentioned earlier, if the menopausal woman is taking estrogen replacement, this will increase the risk for hepatocellular toxicity when used with dantrolene. So tell those females to avoid dantrolene. For those taking neuromuscular junction blockers, for lincosamines, Quinidine, magnesium sulfate, anticholinesterase agents, succinylcholine, polymyxin, aminoglycosides, because they will increase the risk for additive effects. So you need to warn patients who are taking these drugs if they are going to take datrolene with them. So if they're taking this drug, they should avoid taking that trolley. Implementation as this area before administering Botox or botulinum toxins because the area with active infection will be exacerbated by the injection. So botulinum toxins can also improve or decrease muscle spasticity when injected into the skeletal muscle. Monitor the IV axis sites of that trolley for for potential extravasation because drug is alkaline and very irritating to tissues. And periodically discontinue dantrolene for two to four days as ordered to monitor therapeutic effectiveness. Discontinue drug at any sign of liver dysfunction to prevent adverse effects on the liver. That's why it's very important for the doctor to order liver function tests. Now, provide comfort measures to help patients tolerate drug effects. Again, the safety measures are applied to prevent injuries and educate the client on when to take the drug, the best time to take it, and until when, in order for them to promote understanding and compliance. So that's it for the lecture regarding um, these drugs for myasthenia gravis and uh, muscle spasms and spasticity. If you have any questions regarding our lecture or for the ones that you read on the session 16 of your modules, please do not hesitate to message me. Again, that's all guys. Have a great day. Thank you.